We'd like to define the definite integral over a planar region in R2, so in the, in the xy plane. If you think about what was done in single variable calculus, what you do there is you've got a function and it's defined on an interval. And you chop the interval up into lots of little subintervals. You take a sample point in each subinterval. You evaluate the function at the sample point. You multiply times the length of the subinterval containing the sample point. And you add all those together. That gives you a Riemann sum. And you take the limit of that process as the, the lengths of the subintervals approach zero. And if that limit exists and is independent of how you chop things up and how the limit of how the limit of the lengths approach zero, then you say f is Riemann integrable, and uh, integral is um, you know, denoted by that curly s symbol, the a b um, f dx. It, in two dimensions, we'd like to do the same thing. We'd like, we have a function defined on some planar region in R2, so some, something with some area. And you'd like, to, you'd like to chop up the region into lots of little pieces. Uh, they'll turn out to be lots of little rectangles or pieces of rectangles. Pick a sample point in each, each sub-rectangle in each little piece. Evaluate the function there. Multiply times the area of the, the little rectangle that contains it. Add those together. Take a limit. We'd like to do the same sort of thing. So that's what we're going to talk about. I'm not, in this first part, I'm not going to give the technical definitions, um, but rather give the intuition, but say the part about Riemann summing again, uh, informally. Um, but we're just going to start with a motivating example. So, so this is just, why would you want to do this? So suppose you have a thin metal plate. You may have heard this called uh, a lamina before, like the word laminate. It's not important what it's called, really. I usually just say a thin metal plate. Suppose you have a thin metal plate. When we talk about lamina, laminas, thin metal plates, we are usually assuming they are idealized two-dimensional objects, that they are so thin you might as well not even talk about that thickness. So we think of it as an idealized two-dimensional object. Um, and in that case, when you think of it that way, um, we you know, suppose we have an area density function. which tells us the area density. What's area density? Uh, so this is mass per, mass per area. So that's why you have to call it an area density, normal density. Just the word density means mass per volume. So, but we're assuming we have an idealized two-dimensional object. It's common to talk about the mass per unit area, which tells us the area density at each point in the plate. And we want to assume that the area density function might be different at different points in the plate, that the plate doesn't have, necessarily, uniform area density. It might be more dense at one point than at another. Then the question is, how do you determine the mass of the plate? All right, so this is kind of a, a standard lead-in question for why we would want the, the integral that we're about to define 
So, well, one thing you do in a problem like this is you would set up an x and y coordinate system around your plate. So typically we would assume I'm going to draw a rectangular plate, but it doesn't have to be a rectangle. We'll see that later. But you set up an x and y coordinate system around your plate. And then being given the area density function means being given what the area density is at each point x, y inside in this picture, inside this rectangle. <coughs> and the question, how would you find the mass of the plate? Well, how would you estimate the mass of the plate? Well, you chop the plate up into lots of little pieces. So think little rectangles. You chop the, that big rectangle up into lots of little sub-rectangles. And in each sub-rectangle, you pick a point, a sample point, like you did in one dimension. You pick a sample point. And if your area density function, well, then you evaluate the area density function at that sample point. And if your area density function is continuous, which will be our typical assumption, then because the area density function is continuous and you're taking small sub-rectangles, the area density at each point in the little sub-rectangle should virtually be the same because your rectangle is small and if the area density function is continuous, it can't jump much in a small amount of distance. So you chop things up into lots of little sub-rectangles. You pick a sample point in each sub-rectangle. You evaluate the area density at the sample point. You tell yourself that's a good estimate of the density everywhere in the little subrectangle, and if the density were actually constant on the subrectangle, the area of that little, uh, the mass of that little subrectangle, would just be the area density function evaluated at the sample point times the area of the subrectangle. Then you, so you'd get for each little subrectangle, you get um, a good estimate of its mass. And then you add up all the masses of the little sub-rectangles, and it gives you an estimate of the mass of the big rectangle, or the big region, the, the whole plate. And then what do you do? You take the limit of that process as the size of the sub-rectangles approaches zero. And if that limit exists and is independent of all the choices, that's what the mass of the plate is. And that's an example of why we want um, integrals in R2, which are usually called double integrals, double for two dimensions. We, the double integral of the area density function over a two-dimensional region should give you the total mass under r nice conditions. So that's what we'd like to do. Um, I said, suppose we've got a rectangle, you chop it up into lots of little sub-rectangles. Well, you may have noticed one little problem um, with that. One little problem is that if we had a region that wasn't a rectangle, and later we're going to look at a region that looks like this, region R that looks like this, because it has slanted sides or curved side, we're not going to be able to chop this up into lots of little rectangles without some of the rectangles hanging over the side. So that is a problem that we'll have to talk about. And it makes the, the situation easier when your region is actually a big rectangle. So we're going to talk about that case. I'm going to talk about that case first. Um, and in the examples. And then we're going to then we're going to do a more general case like this region. But um, all right, so really you have to write down some summations. You have to talk about partitioning subintervals and meshes, uh, meshes of partitions, and you have to write some limiting, some limiting quantities. But I'm not going to do that in this portion of the section. In this portion of the section, we're just going to use the intuition I was just giving you. We're going to write two integral symbols, an r, an f of x, y, and a dA for the double, the Riemann integral of 
of f on r, uh, people also say over, over may even be more common, over r, it's also called the double integral of f over r. And I'll say again what our intuition for this is and how we do define it, except we have to make all the things rigorous. This is supposed to represent a little blob of area. And so what, what does this mean? It means <coughs> you chop up the region R into lots of little rectangles, or some of them will be partial rectangles if you have a curved region like I just erased. Um, some of the rectangles some will be, have parts that are contained. You know, if I draw a little rectangle right there, part of the rectangle is inside the curved region and part of it is outside. What do you do with those? The answer is you count them or you don't count them. The process should be independent of whether you count the little rectangles that hang over the boundary or not. You chop up your region R into lots of little sub-rectangles or partial rectangles that hang over the, the boundary. You pick a sample point in each rectangle or sub-rectangle. You evaluate the function at the sample point. You multiply that value at the sample point times the area of the, uh, of the little rectangle containing it. Even if it hangs over the side, you multiply times the area of the whole region. Um, but you, and then you take the sum of all of those, but where you either include in your sum the, partial, the sums from the partial rectangles, or you don't. And if the limit of that process is independent of all the choices, including whether you take the partial sub-rectangles or not, if the limit of that sum exists and is independent of all the choices you made, so independent of how you chopped it up, how you picked the sample points, whether you include the partial rectangles that hang over the side or not, independent of that, then we say that this double integral exists, the Riemann integral exists, that f is Riemann integrable, we say f is Riemann integrable over r, and the value of the integral is the limit of that sum. So that's what it is intuitively. That is what you write rigorous definitions for and what's contained in the more depth portion of the book, but uh, of the section. But we're just going to go with our intuition, and I'm going to state some theorems, or our intuition. We're going to go with the words I just said, which isn't exactly intuitive. How should you think of this? Really, just like you thought of integrals in a single variable. You should think the double integral is a continuous sum, and it's a continuous sum of infinitesimal contributions of you take the value of f at points in R, you multiply it times infinitesimal chunks of area, the dA, and then you, continual, you take a continuous sum of all of those little infinitesimal contributions. So that's, that's the intuition. That's how you should think of it. So let's do it. Um, we need, yeah, OK. I just gave you, in words, the definition of this. So yeah, you chop things up in little pieces. You take sample points, Riemann sums. But that doesn't tell you which functions are Riemann integrable, so which function, for which functions this integral exists. And it certainly doesn't tell you how to calculate it, even when the integral does exist. How do you do those things? Well, we have a theorem. The big theorem, Fubini's theorem. Ah, ah, I need to define a rectangle for you first. That may seem a little silly, but I need to give the, the notation for it. So, um, yeah. It, it's a little easier to define integration on rectangles, on big rectangles, and I, but I, and I do want to define the kind of clo the, the closed rectangles that we like to integrate over. So the closed rectangle, so that means it includes its boundary. The closed rectangle, we usually write R for region or rectangle, but A, B cross C, D. What are A, B, C, and D? Just numbers, so A is less than B. C is less than D, so that these closed intervals make sense. What does we write? We say um, the closed interval AB cross 
the closed interval CD. What does that mean? This is <coughs> the set of XY such that X is between A and B, including A and B, and Y is between C and D. So it's a rectangle. In, in a picture, it, would, it doesn't have to be jammed in the corner of the XY plane. It, it would just be this rectangle if A were here, B were here, C were here and D were here. All right. Now that we know what a rectangle is, I can go on with stating Fubini's theorem. Fubini's theorem. Suppose F is continuous on the rectangle R equals AB cross CD. Then F is Riemann integrable on R. And, and here's the big deal how do you calculate? this limit of Riemann sums, this continuous sum of infinitesimal contributions. As promised, when we did the last section, you use iterated integrals. The double integral over R of f of x, y, dA <coughs> equals either you can put dx on the inside or dy on the inside. I'll put dx on the inside first, and x goes from a to b, and y goes from c to d. Or you can have it reversed and have the y on the inside and the x on the outside, and I think I'm going to fit that right here. The integral from a to b, the integral from c to d of f of xy with dy on the inside and dx on the outside. So. This is certainly what you use most of the time to, or all the time, to calculate definite integrals, Riemann integrals, double integrals, of continuous functions on rectangles. It's, um, I, I should warn you that in a few minutes when, when we do a more general region, not just a rectangle, you're going to see that here, when I swapped x and y and I put I moved dx to the outside and dy to the inside. All I did was swap the limits of integration. That's because they're constants, and this is, and which means we're integrating over a rectangle, right? This is the x is between c and d, uh, the y is between c and d, and the, the x is between a and b. That defines the rectangle r. But when we're doing a more general region, what you certainly do not do is just swap limits of integration because typically there'll be functions of the variable out that's farther outside. So, but first let's do an example of this. So let's take a thin metal plate, a lamina. And the actual example I want to do is I've got my thin metal plate. I'm measuring distances in meters. It goes out to three meters and two meters. So there's my thin metal plate. And I want an area density function that's one plus xy kilograms per square meter. What's the mass of the plate? OK. So there's the question. Um, 
Well, this, this variable area density, for instance, it means when x and y are zero, or actually when x or y is zero, the area density is one kilogram per square meter along these two edges, because that's where x or y is zero. On the other hand, over here at this corner, x times y is six, so the area density there is seven kilograms per square meter. So the area density is definitely changing quite a bit over this big rectangle, and that's why this is an integration problem. You have this continuously changing area density that you need to multiply by, and you know you, it only gives you a good estimate if you just multiply a single number if you have a very tiny rectangle. So you take a continuous sum of these infinitesimal contributions and get what you want. So here's Fubini's theorem. It tells us how to calculate that. It says that if I want the mass, I should add up all the little blobs of mass. So I would really write it that way. Well, maybe not with the word blob, but <laughs> aside from that. <laughs> so you do this, dm, an infinitesimal chunk of mass. That's how you should think of it. Uh, of course, we could set this up in terms of Riemann sums, but then the notation gets out of hand and you have to take limits. It really is nice to think about these things existing as infinitesimal chunks of mass. And how do you get an infinitesimal chunk of mass? You take the area density function at x, y, and multiply. So this is mass per area. And you multiply times an infinitesimal chunk of area. So this gives you an infinitesimal chunk of mass. Uh, an integral, so a double integral in this case, is a continuous sum. So what we want to do is write the total mass equals the double integral over r of dm, just a continuous sum of all the little blobs of mass as you range through points in the region r. I didn't name the rectangle r. The rectangle is r. 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 Um, and then you put in, okay, this is double integral over r, our area density function, which we're given. We were told the area density function is 1 plus xy. This will come out in kilograms, so I'll drop the units along the way. Now instead of dA, Fubini's theorem says, I calculate this with iterated integrals, with either dx or dy on the inside. Um, just to start, I'll put, I'll do it both ways. Let me put dy on the inside and dx on the outside. Then y is going from 0 to 2. x is going from 0 to 3. And we have to calculate this relatively simple iterated, iterated integral. So you do that. You get the integral from 0 to 3. You integrate this with respect to y. You get y plus x y squared over 2. It's evaluated as y goes from 0 to 2. We still need to integrate with respect to x after we're finished. You get the integral from 0 to 3. When y is 2, you get 2. Um, and then you get 4 divided by 2, so you get 2. 2 plus 2x. You subtract what you get when y is 0, but that's 0. And then you integrate with respect to x. So you get 2x plus x squared evaluated from 0 to 3. You get 6 plus 9 minus what you get at 0, which is 0, so 15. 15 watts, 15 kilograms. So that's the mass of the plate, 15 kilograms. Um, could we do it the other way? Sure. Let's, let's reverse. So I'm about to put the dx on the inside and the dy on the outside. This is known as reversing the order of integration. Um, the, it calculates the same double integral. Understand, the double integral is what we say for this limit of Riemann sums, the continuous sum, 
This is an iterated integral, which is how you calculate the, the double integral. Um, and then you talk about reversing the order of integration, and that means changing the order in which you iterate the integrals. So let's put the dx on the inside and the dy on the outside and make sure that we still get 15. If we don't, either I've made a mistake or there's a fundamental contradiction in mathematics. I'd go with I made a mistake. But we'll see. If we integrate in the other direction, we should find the same thing. The double integral of 1 plus xy over this region r. Now we'll calculate it with an iterated integral that has dx on the inside. So 1 plus xy, dx is on the inside, dy is on the outside. x still goes from 0 to 3, y goes from 0 to 2. But now you do the x integral first, this inside one. And so you get the integral from 0 to 2. Of, now you get x plus x squared y over 2, evaluated as x goes from 0 to 3. And then you still will have to integrate with respect to y. You plug in x is 3. You get 3 plus 9y over 2, minus what you get when x is 0. But when x is 0, you just get 0. So you get this. And now you integrate with respect to y. And you get 3y plus 9y squared over 4, evaluated from 0 to 2. You plug in y equals 2, you subtract what you get at 0. At 0 you get 0. At 2 you get 6 plus 9 times 4 divided by 4 plus 9, 6 plus 9, 15. Yippee. Math works again. Um, notice that the calculations actually look a little worse with this order of integration. Not, <laughs> I don't mean really bad, it's just, I don't know, we got, we got a 9, we got 9 halves and 9 fourths and you know, in our final evaluation, we had fractions instead of 2x plus x squared. That can happen, and, and we're going to see more complicated examples where when you integrate in one direction, it's easier. When you integrate in the other direction, it's either harder or impossible. And it, may, it should be completely unclear to you how it could be impos impossible, in quotes, in one direction when it's possible in the other. But I will get to that in a minute. But, so that's how you integrate over rectangles. What do you do over more general regions? And the types of regions that we're mainly worried about are regions, well, regions that are trapped between the graphs of functions. So for instance, I keep drawing this region. This is meant to be the curve, part of the curve, y equals x squared. This is y equals x. And the region trapped in between is what we want to call r. So this is our region r. How do you integrate over a region like that? Well, first of all, it would be helpful to know these x and y coordinates. Well, they're both 1. Um, if I didn't tell you that, you set these two y coordinates equal to each other. You get x equals x squared. So x is 0, x is 1. Here's x is 0, here's x is 1. All right. Um, and what's nice is this region r can be described by, oh, the x coordinates. So r, one way to describe it is the x coordinates are between 0 and 1. And for every x-coordinate between 0 and 1, for every x-coordinate between 0 and 1, your y-coordinates go from y equals x squared up to y equals x. So it means that your y-coordinates are trapped between x squared and x. What's important here is this is a, a closed interval, so a compact interval, a closed bounded interval, and that these functions, x squared and x are continuous functions on that closed interval, and y is trapped in between those. We could also describe r as 
Oh, if you look at the y-coordinates, it's where the y-coordinates are between 0 and 1. And then for each y-coordinate between 0 and 1, what, do you, what x-coordinates do you have inside your region? Well, for a given y-coordinate, the x-coordinates of points, of corresponding points in the region, the x-coordinates start at x equals y, and they go over to x equals the square root of y, because this part in the first quadrant is the same as x equals the square root of y. So you can say, oh, well, the y is between 0 and 1, and then for a given y-coordinate between 0 and 1, the corresponding x-coordinates start at x equals y and go up to x equals the square root of y. And these are the types, types of regions that we want to integrate over, where you start with a compact interval, so a closed bounded interval from my A to B, and then that, that one of the variables is in. And then the other variable is trapped between continuous functions of, of that variable. And then there's a nice theorem that applies to that case. In fact, this is, these are almost the only kinds of regions we'll deal with in the xy plane, other than possibly regions that can be broken up into pieces that look like this, where the pieces overlap along curves, so along things that have no area, so they don't, it's a theorem that they won't contribute to the Riemann integral. So what's the theorem that lets us integrate over regions like that? Well, I'll state it in this case, where x is in a bounded interval, and then y is between two continuous functions of x. But the same theorem, in the same theorem, you could switch the roles of x and y. The same theorem applies with x and y switched, and y is in some bounded interval, and then the x-coordinates are between two continuous functions of y. But um, the theorem is, suppose, Uh, I'll call them P and Q. P and Q are continuous functions on the closed interval AB. And that R the region where of xy, of xy pairs, where x is between a and b, and, ah, I should have said something up there, well, it kind of follows here, but where x is between a and b, and the y-coordinate is always between p of x and q of x. So, of course, for this to make sense, for this to be what I want, I actually need for p of x to be less than or equal to q of x on the entire interval a, b. Suppose on the closed interval a, b, and it, somewhere up here, it would be nice to include that, oh yes, and p of x is always less than or equal to q of x, for x in a, b, so that this actually happens, so that there's some y coordinates in there, um, and that r is the region of x, y, where, and if f is a continuous function on r, then f is Riemann integrable on r, and you calculate the Riemann integral, the double integral, by an iterated integral. And what iterated, what iterated integral is it? The one you expect. Then f is Riemann integrable
on our and the double integral over r of f of x y dA equals the integral from a to b, the integral from p of x to q of x of f of x y dy dx. Right? Your y coordinates, so this is an iterated integral, your y coordinates are between p of x and q of x. As we said, your x coordinates are between a and b. But you could also describe this with the dx on the inside and the dy on the outside. And you'd have a very different looking iterated integral. So let me set these up, both limits, both sets of limits of integration for that region, and then we'll actually integrate something over the region. But so let's look at, oh, yeah, let me just set up. So what this says, for instance, is if you're trying to integrate a function f over this region r, what do you do? A continuous function. It says, oh, the integral of any continuous function over this region exists, and you can calculate it by letting x go from 0 to 1, and y go from x squared to x, and then you put it in, uh, yeah. And then you put in whatever your continuous function is, and dy is on the inside and dx is on the outside. But if you describe the region like this, with the y coordinate in this bounded interval and the x coordinate between two functions of y, then you'd get a very different looking integral. You would, you'd have your limits of integration for y on the outside. You'd still have the integral from 0 to 1. That's actually a fluke. It's not the same 0 and 1. That the 0 and 1 in the first integral is on the x-axis. The 0 and 1 in the second in this integral is on the y-axis. Yeah, it's 0 and 1, but that's unusual. And this certainly won't look the same. Your x-coordinates go between y and the square root of y. And then you integrate the function. Notice, if you're, trying to, if you're supposed to get a number out of here, the limits of integration on the outside better be constants. And notice that when we switch, ah, well, we didn't switch. That is a mistake. Hopefully you noticed that. I'm glad I noticed it before I went on anymore. Uh, I meant to put the dx on the inside and the dy on the outside. Now, let's try it again. Notice that when I switch the order of integration, I reverse the order of integration, I put the dx on the inside and the dy on the outside, I don't just switch the limits of integration here. We didn't end up with x and x squared on the outside. If we did, when you do the double, the iterated integral, you'd end up with a function of x. We don't want that. No, you really have to, when your region is not a rectangle, you have to fundamentally recalculate these limits of integration. It's not a trivial thing to do in some cases, but it's important that you do it. If you can't figure out new limits of integration, you shouldn't be integrating in whatever order you're trying to integrate in. All right, so this is what you do. Let's uh, calculate this for, I want f of xy is 2xy plus 6y squared. So let's So this is really essentially the same example. I've got the same region R that we were just looking at, but I want to take the double integral over R of the specific function 2xy plus 6y squared dA. I'm going to calculate this. I'm going to calculate this in both directions or so. I'm going to have dy dx, and then I'm going to do dx dy, or maybe in the other order. And verify that we get the same thing both times. If we don't, 
there's a problem and we did something wrong. All right, so what do you get? All right, well, we can do this with dy on the inside and dx on the outside. And as we said, then you get the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from x squared to x of 2xy plus 6y squared dy dx. You do the inside integral first, and then you'll still have an outside integral to do. So you get the integral from 0 to 1. You integrate with respect to y on the inside. You get um, xy squared plus 6y cubed over 3. That's 2y cubed. And you evaluate as y goes from x squared to x. And after you do that, you still need to integrate with respect to x. So you plug in. You plug in y equals x. So we get x cubed plus 2x cubed. So that's 3x cubed. And then you subtract what you get when y is x squared. So that's x to the fifth plus 2x to the 6, but we're subtracting. So you get a minus x to the 5th and a minus 2x to the 6th. And we still have to integrate with respect to x. So you do that. You get 3x to the 4th over 4 minus x to the 6th over 6 minus 2x to the 7th over 7 Evaluated from 0 to 1. At 0, this is all 0, so the value of this is what you get at 1, so it's 3 fourths minus 1 sixth minus 1 seventh, which um, in, I guess, the easiest thing is in 80 fourths. Well, uh, you can write this in terms of 80 fourths, but let's just leave it as it is. So um, this is what you get. All right. What we'd like, well, actually to compare it with what we'll get in a minute, I suppose we better do it. So in terms of 80 fourths, um, we will need to, to get 80 fourths. We need to multiply this by 21. So this is, I don't know where I think I'm going to write this. This is 63 80 fourths minus, um, we need to multiply this by 14, um, so minus 14 80 fourths, and then you have to multiply this by 12, minus 12 80 fourths, so I get 63 minus 26, so 30, 37 80 fourths. 26, 63, yeah, 37 80 fourths is what I get. I wanted that number so that I could compare it with what I'm about to get. Ah, except I see a 2 just mysteriously vanished in our calculation. That would be bad. This would mean we wouldn't get the same thing. Don't ask me. I plugged in 1 at 3 fourths minus a 6. This should be minus 2 sevenths. I don't know where that 2 went went into some mysterious black hole. So this should be 24 up here. 24, and so we need to subtract another 12 here. So let's try 25 80 fourths. All right, so now I get 25 80 fourths. We'll see if this agrees with our, the calculation in the other direction. If it doesn't, well, there's a mistake somewhere. All right. But let's try it in the other direction and make sure that we do, in fact, get 25 80 fourths. So. All right, so this double integral of 2xy plus 6y squared dA, we, we should be able to calculate it with an iterated integral where we've reversed the 
the iteration, and I should say again, since I erased it, that we're using the Y coordinate. Draw the picture. It really does help to have the picture. The, your Y coordinate is going between 0 and 1, and for a given Y coordinate, your X coordinate is going from Y to the square root of Y. So if we're going to have dy on the outside, you have 0 and 1. You'll have dx on the inside, go from y to the square root of y. You have the integrand, the 2xy plus 6y squared. We have dx on the inside and dy on the outside. So this time, you integrate first. You do the inside integral first. That's the integral with respect to x. And so you get x squared y x squared y plus 6xy squared evaluated as x goes from y to the square root of y. And then you have to integrate again with respect to y. All right, so you plug in. You plug in x is the square root of y, so you get the square root of y squared, that's y, y times y, you get y squared. Here you get plus 6, you get a square root of y here, that's y to the 1 half, this is 4 halves, so you get y to the 5 halves, and then you subtract what you get when x equals y. When x is y, you get y cubed, and you subtract a 6y cubed, so a minus 7y cubed, and you still have to integrate this with respect to y. All right, so you integrate with respect to y, and you get y cubed over 3 plus 6 times, you add 1 to the exponent, 7 halves, divide by 7 halves, minus 7y to the 4th over 4, evaluated from 0 to 1. You can invert this and multiply and get 12 sevenths, so this is the same as 12 sevenths. At 0, this is 0, so you get what you get when y is 1. This is 1 third plus 12 sevenths minus 7 fourths. <laughs> is it, in fact, 25 80 fourths? Well, <clears throat> we'll see. Um, the common denominator here is 80 fourths, that's good. So this is 28 80 fourths plus 144 80 fourths minus 21 times 7, right? The, you have to multiply 4 by 21. 21 times 7, 147. Minus 147, 84, that's 144 minus 147, minus 3, 28 minus 3, 25, yippee! <laughs> Calculations without a calculator, we get 25, 84 again. Good. You can see that the calculations in terms with dx on the inside and dy on the outside versus what you get when you reverse the order of the integration looks completely different. The intermediate steps, completely different and yet you end up with the same number. You have to. They both equal the same double integral. Um, I still want to look at three more examples. Um, one of them is, is an easier kind of example of this, of the double integral over this exact region. So as a, another example, what would you get if you just calculated the integral of 1? The function that's always 1. Well, the, the limits of integration, one of the nice things about this whole theory is if you're just changing the integrand, and I say just, and it's not a trivial thing, but if you're just changing the integrand, the limits of integration that you write in the iterated integrals don't change. You can use the same limits of integration over and over again to give you an iterated integral that equals the double integral um, 
It's, of course, all the calculations will be different when you change the integrand. But, all right, so my question is, what does this calculate? Well, 1 times dA is just dA. It's a little blob of area. This is the continuous sum of all the little blobs of area in the region R. Well, that's the area of R. This is how you calculate area with a double integral. Um, this is the area, well, you could write, in fact, we usually wouldn't write the 1 times dA. I don't know whether this looks more confusing or less, but 1 times dA, we just write dA. This is the area of the region R. And you calculate it by this iterated integral. And that means you do this inside integral first. So you get the integral from 0 to 1. The integral of 1 with respect to y is just y. You evaluate as y goes from x squared to, to x. And then you integrate with respect to x. That means you take the integral from 0 to 1 of x minus x squared dx. Well. Yeah, we can do this. It, it's easy. You get x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to 1. So you get a half minus a third. That's 3 6 minus 2 6. It's a sixth. And if we had some distance units, like maybe square meters, it's the area. But my real point of doing this is, of course that's what we get. Because if you calculated the area of this in single variable calculus, exactly what you would have done would be to integrate as x goes from 0 to 1 and you'd look at the heights for each x coordinate between 0 and 1 you'd look at this this long rectangle which has an infinitesimal thickness but a finite length and you would calculate the infinitesimal areas of all of these rectangles and add them up that's what this integral gave you in single variable calculus the height of that infinitesimal rectangle is that y-coordinate minus that y-coordinate. That's x. In terms of x, it's x minus x squared. That's the height times an infinitesimal thickness. You take the continuous sum. This is how you calculated area in single variable calculus. And at the heart of it, this is, this is how you prove Fubini's theorem, or this is how the proof of Fubini's theorem goes, or the theorem we're using right now on regions of a more general shape, it's, yeah, the double integral really breaks things up into lots of little infinitesimal rectangles inside here. But if you just count them by taking the ones in these narrow strips, then you can calculate the infinitesimal area in each narrow strip first, and then yeah, Fubini's theorem basically says, yeah, the double integral over this region, the limit of the Riemann sums as you chop things up into little rectangles, if you had just been, had done them in the order of, you count the rectangles in vertical strips first, then yeah, you get this, what you get from this iterated integral. So Fubini's theorem intuitively is not so bad, or the why you can calculate this with iterated integrals is not so bad, but, but of course the details are something we don't want to do. Um, all right, I do want to look at two more examples, one of which is complicated, and I don't think I'll actually do the calculation, but I will set up the limits of integration because that's the point. And then I want to look at a double integral or an iterated integral that you can't do the way it's written, so you write it as a double integral, then you reverse the, limit, the order of integration, and you get an iterated integral that you can actually do very easily. It's kind of cool. But let's first look at, I want to look at an example where you chop a region up into two pieces, because this does occur from time to time. Um, and it, you need to know how to handle it. Typically, or frequently, we don't want to chop integrals up into pieces. It's aesthetically not as pleasing as just doing a single double integral. It could be easier. It could be harder. It certainly, at least at first glance, doesn't look very nice. So let's take the region. I want to take a look at the region that is below the graph of the parabola y equals, so this is y equals 4 minus x squared. 
and above the line y equals 3x in the first quadrant. So I want to take a look at, maybe I won't even try to draw it to scale in order to make my region fatter for better visibility. I want this region. So this is my region R, the region in the first quadrant bounded between the graphs of y equals 4 minus x squared and y equals 3x. And what I so this is my region R, and what I want to do is set up double integrals for integrating over that region regardless of what the continuous function is. In the example in the book, I actually picked a specific continuous function, but um, the whole point here is how you break it up as how you split the double integral. So I'll just assume I've got an arbitrary continuous function and not actually calculate the integrals. How do you integrate over that region R? Well, in, as you can imagine, we need to find this point of intersection. So how do you do that? You set the y coordinates equal to each other. You get 4 minus x squared equals 3x. So x squared plus 3x minus 4 equals 0. This factors as x plus 4 times x minus 1 equals 0. So roots of that, x is minus 4, which we don't care about, and x is 1. So, and when x is 1, you get y is 3, both places. So this is the point 1, 3. So I'll say again, my picture is not, my sketch is not to, or the scales on the axes are certainly not the same. Um, so this is 3, and this is 4. All right. The question is, how do you set up a double integral of some function? All right. How do you write a double integral of any continuous function on that region in terms of iterated integrals? So I'm assuming f is just some continuous function. I don't care which one. And the question is, how do you write this as an iterated integral? Well, the, the nicest way to set it up, at least until you find that integrating f this way is difficult, would be to look at it as the region where x is between 0 and 1. So go ahead and put that on the outside. x is between 0 and 1. So, and for every x between 0 and 1, for every x-coordinate between 0 and 1, the corresponding y-coordinates in the region, so you take some x-coordinate between 0 and 1, the corresponding y-coordinates in your region go from y equals 3x up to y equals 4 minus x squared. So you just, those are your limits of integration. Now you go from y equals 3x to y equals 4 minus x squared. Great. So that's one way to set up this double integral is an iterated integral. But what if you wanted the dx on the inside and the dy on the outside? That's why I really wanted to do this example. If you want the, the dy on the outside, well clearly your y-coordinate, it's every place you've got y-coordinates in the region. So your y-coordinate, your y-coordinates in the region um, are always between 0 and 4. So We'd like to write this as some integral from 0 to 4 and some integral from something to something with the dx on the inside and the dy on the outside. The problem, and you probably saw it already, is that the way you describe the region changes when you cross through y equals 3. There are two subregions. There's this region above where y is 3, that I'll call r sub 1, and this region down here that I'll call r sub 2. And the, the problem is that when you're at a y-coordinate between 0 and 3, your x-coordinates and your corresponding x-coordinates are trapped between the, the y-axis and this line. So when you're at any y-coordinate between 0 and 3, your corresponding x-coordinates go from the y-axis out to this line segment. 
On the other hand, when you're in this region R1, so when your y-coordinate is greater than 3, your corresponding x-coordinates start at 0 but go over to the x-coordinate on the parabola. So in this part of the region, the equation for the parabola is irrelevant, and up here the equation for the line is irrelevant. This means that we need to break up the integral into two pieces. That what we should first say is, oh, this double integral is the same as the double integral over R1 of f of x, y, dA, plus the double integral over R2 of f of x, y, dA. Are you really allowed to break up integrals into pieces so that we have manageable pieces that go along with our theorem that tells us how to integrate on nice regions? And the answer is yes, because R1 and R2 overlap on this line segment, which has no area. And it's part of the theorems that we're not going into the details of. Yeah, because their overlap has no area, that overlap doesn't get counted twice. It's not causing a problem. And yeah, you can split up the integral, the double integral over R, into the two double integrals, the sum of the double integrals over R1 and R2. All right. Well, then it becomes easier to, uh, that now it's relatively easy. Um, this line was y equals 3x. That's the same as saying x equals 1 third y. And we're going to want to rewrite this as x in terms of y, at least in the first quadrant. Subtract y from both sides, put the x squared over there. Take square roots, you get x's over here, so this part. This part, where x is positive, is x equals the square root of 4 minus y. All right. And then your limits of integration are relatively easy to set up when you set up the iterated integrals. But you'll have different iterated integrals for each piece. In R1, your y-coordinates are going from 3 to 4. And for each y-coordinate between 3 and 4, your x-coordinate starts at 0 and goes out to x equals the square root of 4 minus y. And then you'd have your function. And dx, dy. But then you have to add to that. The integral as y goes from 0 to 3. And now your x-coordinates in this subregion, r2, your x-coordinates go from 0 out to the x-coordinate on the line. So you go from 0 to 1 third y. And then you have f of x, y, dx, dy. So you can split that double integral up into two pieces and get a different iterated integral on each, for each, the integral over each piece. Um, will this be easier or harder than integrating with dx on the outside and just having one, one iterated integral? Well, it depends on the function f. Um, typically, we would try the other way first, just to have one integral and do everything in one piece. But if it's undoable that way, you try switching the, the order of the, reversing the order of integration and seeing if it gets any easier. Which brings me to the last example I want to do right now, which is calculating an iterated integral that at first glance looks completely undoable. So calculate. I want the integral from 0 to 1, the integral from y to 1, of e to the minus x squared dx dy. All right. This is an iterated integral. It's not a double integral. It's already set up as an iterated integral. Why are we doing it in this section? Iterated integrals were done in the last section. Because we can't do this inside integral. We can't. You should remember from single variable calculus, e to the minus x squared is one of those fundamental functions that has no elementary antiderivative. That means you can't apply the fundamental theorem of calculus to this inside integral and produce a nice function of x that's some finite combination of, of the functions that we use all the time. <coughs> so, um, excuse me. So, what do you do? Well, 
One choice is give up. We're not going to do that one. The other choice is, well, maybe, maybe, if we reverse the order of the integration, somehow we'll get an extra x in here, and we'll be able to do an integral, do the integral that we end up with. That is what's going to happen, and that's really cool, because the way it's set up, you can't do this one. So we have to write this as a double integral first, then reverse the limits of integration, which means all that writing it as a double integral means is you have to know what region this is the double integral over. And it is the y-coordinate is between 0 and 1. And the x-coordinate, for any y between 0 and 1, the x-coordinate is between y and 1. So how do you know what that region is? All right, you should really start, it's best to start down here. Um, this means that your x-coordinates go, the way to read this now is, your x-coordinates go from y equals x to x equals 1. So, right, your x-coordinates start where x equals y or y equals x and they go up to where x equals 1. So you draw x equals 1. So x equals 1, this is vertical line. You draw y equals x. Here's y equals x. And what's happening is that for every y coordinate between 0 and 1, so here's 1, for every y coordinate between 0 and 1, your x coordinates are going from y equals x up to x equals 1. So they're going from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. For every y coordinate between 0 and 1, your x coordinates go from y equals x to, or from x equals y to x equals 1. Well, that means you're integrating over this triangle. So this is the region R, and if you call that R, then this is the double integral over R of e to the minus x squared dA. Now you don't really, you know you can write it like this, and you, because you know you can, you don't explicitly have to write that intermediate step. Our goal is to write, is to reverse the limits of the order of integration here. So we now want to write this as a double integral, of the same integrand, but we want the dy on the inside because we can do that integral e to the minus x squared is a constant as far as y is concerned. The question is, then what, the, what are the limits of integration when we reverse the order of, of integration? And it really helps to have sketched the region to figure out what those are. So what are they? Well, your x-coordinates in the region, all the x-coordinates in the region are between 0 and 1. So you still have 0 and 1 on the outside. But now, what do your y-coordinates do for a given x-coordinate? So you're given some x-coordinate between 0 and 1. What are the corresponding points in your region? So what y-coordinates do you have? Your y-coordinate goes down here from y equals 0 up to y equals x. For any x-coordinate, your y-coordinates are starting at 0 and going up to y equals x. So your y-coordinates are going, always going from 0 up to y equals x. So this is your new iterated integral. And its value is the same as the value of this iterated integral, which existed because this is continuous, and so the, um, the, integral, the iterated integral exists. But getting a formula for it by the fundamental theorem is what's difficult. So we write it as the double integral, or at least look at the region r, so we can reverse the limits of integration, and then we try to calculate. And if, well, this is rigged, of course, to be one you can do. You get e to the minus x squared times y, because e to the minus x squared is a constant as far as y is concerned. You evaluate as y goes from 0 to y equals x, and then you still have to integrate with respect to x. What do you get? You get the integral from 0 to 1, you put in x equals y, or y equals x, subtract what you get when y is 0, so you get x e to the minus x squared dx. And you should realize 
this just made this doable because we picked up this extra x. And now there's an easy substitution that will allow us to do this integral if we let u equal minus x squared, or you could just go with x squared, but if you let u be minus x squared, then du is minus 2x dx, so that minus a half du is x dx, and this integral becomes the single variable integral that you should have known how to do back in single variable calculus. e to the minus x squared is now e to the u, the x dx is minus a half du, and it helps to switch your limits of integration. When x is zero, u is when x is zero, u is minus zero squared, still zero. When x is one, u is minus one squared, so minus one. You need to calculate that. This is this is easy. Um, you can. Put these in the kind of increasing order, so switch the limits of integration and wipe out that minus sign and get a half. And then the integral of e to the u with respect to u is just e to the u, and you'll eva evaluate from minus 1 to 0. Right? I switched the limits of integration at the same time, wiped out a minus sign. So you get 1 half e to 0, 1 minus what you get when u is minus 1, so e to the minus 1. So 1 half, 1 minus 1 over e. That's the answer. I'm not really, I don't really care what the number is. I don't care about getting it as a decimal. What I cared about was, look, here's an iterated integral that looks impossible. But if you write it as a double integral, and then write it as an iterated integral in the other direction, so reverse the order of the integration, suddenly it's not just doable, it's easy. When this one looked impossible. All right. In the next section, well, this was double integrals. In the next section, we'll do triple integrals over regions in space.